Hi, I'm Jim Smith. This is the 1000. Welcome. Well, today's episode's a beginning of an interesting series. This is entitled 1978, when the Liberals invented the gun lobby. And of course, like everything to do with our Alice in Wonderland down the rabbit hole existence through the looking glass uh, that characterized gun politics in Ottawa, it doesn't start in 78, but it starts very early in the 70s. It was obvious to our leaders, to thoughtful people, uh, Frank Berrigan, who is a Winchester collector and a carpenter, smart guy, uh, was the spark plug behind Faro, one of the early uh, lobby groups. Uh, guys like Tomlinson and Ray Laycock, Major Laycock, was already writing all columns every month in the Gunrunner magazine, pretty well laying out what was happening. Bill Jones out east was organizing, but all across Canada, people were organizing from from Nova Scotia right through to uh, British Columbia. Uh, the writing was pretty well on the wall, and the waiting for the shoe to drop, the shoe dropped in 1976 with Bill C-83. Now, I'd like to explain to our non, and maybe Canadian viewers, and maybe some of our Canadian viewers, these numbers that we use are temporary numbers that are uh, put forward to make it easy accounting, but instead of putting like the year in front of like 76, 83 or 82 or whatever. They just have a number and each one's for a session. Sessions can run anywhere from a few months to a couple of years. So it really makes it complicated. And we have overlaps of C-17s and C-51s and stuff like that, where they've been multiple uses for the same thing. And when we, we refer to them as kind of like a code, uh, most people don't know what the heck we're talking about because of the temporary nature. So 1976, they call it the Criminal Code Amendment Act of 1976, which Criminal Law Amendment Act, pardon me, which really is a kind of a useless sort of thing. But it was a gun control bill, and it was pretty hefty. And I, I'm reading from notes here, and I don't apologize for this because this is complicated. I'm simplifying it as much as I can without losing the flavor of the, the events so you know what's going on. C-83, first thing that comes to mind is banning cheap, low-quality handguns from Canada. Of course, this was Saturday Night Special. There was a, uh, an article, ironically enough, in a Saturday Night Magazine, I believe, maybe it was Atlantic, about Saturday Night Specials in the United States. So, of course, immediately we've got to go out and ban them. Uh, this eventually drifts on to later legislation to ban 25 and 32 autos by caliber because nobody could figure out what the definition of a cheap, low-quality handgun was. Uh, of course, it's not up to a politician to actually think about these things, just to blast force with them. They're going to have a federal firearms license, uh, was, and you're going to have to have two guarantors to, uh, to state that you're a person of good standing. This, of course, still exists with us today, something they really wanted to do. Protection of private property was removed from the... Uh, from the uh, you use this for firearms. And this is really interesting because up until 1976, 78, because it stays in, the private property could be protected with, with firearms. And in the jewelry district of Montreal, this was really, uh, well, more or less ignored, to be really candid with you, because people, couriers, are running around uh, from jeweler to jeweler with a million dollars worth of jewels on them, and uh, they're going to protect their property and that was the way it goes. They might say they're protecting their lives, but it was property. But basically for you and I, we were humped. We were beat. The justice minister at the time was a guy by the name of Ron Bassford, uh, BC lawyer, uh, still around, uh, uh, lawyer for Greenpeace, I understand. I could be wrong on that, so I stand to be corrected, but that's my understanding. So it gives you a kind of idea he's not exactly a conservative kind of guy at the best of times. Bassford says, oh, Police should protect you, and if you need a gun, well, a rifle's a lot better thing to have, or maybe a shotgun, which kind of shows he knows nothing about guns. Uh, I mean, if I cut loose in the house with a rifle, even if it's just a little .223, uh, those bullets are quite potentially going to go through walls. In fact, we have 
uh, a story we will tell you about a police officer caught between shooting a 9mm pistol and shooting a 12 gauge shotgun in a life or death situation and the choices he had to make uh, based on the penetrative power of the various rounds. Uh, but Bastard didn't know a whole lot about guns and he didn't want to learn. We we're going to have dealer's licenses popped up including ammunition licenses. Um, Retail sales had to be registered. That's what we called the, the, the log book or whatever. And these are to be kept uh, as a record. Uh, when I had my dealer's license in the 80s, they only had to be kept for three years. But you know what I find amazing? I go into dealers, big dealers, prominent dealers, who still got books so old that they have my signatures in them from the 1980s when I had a dealer's license. Now, they only required by law to keep them for three years, but they kept them in perpetuity, which in fact meant, because of this, these people were aiding and abetting the creation of a backdoor registry, uh, uh, a uh, concept that this isn't going to go away, of having the dealers keep track of all the guns they sell, and the police come around and, and quote, inspect them, unquote, uh, without warrant whenever they feel like it, to see what's going on. It's kind of an interesting concept. It means that uh, the dealers bear the cost of the registries, just fascinating. This is the first time we hear about safe storage. They just call it reasonable storage. Uh, this becomes, uh, again, uh, a stalking horse to prevent the, um, the um, Canadian citizens from having a gun self-defense because they have to be locked up and such things like that. Now, here's an interesting one. Any person using an offensive weapon while co committing an indictable offense will be subject to imprisonment for at least one, but no more than 14 years. But it runs consecutive to any other sentences. Now, one of the things that gun owners have said all the way along is, instead of punishing us, the gun people, are punish punishing the tool, the gun, why don't you go have people that, that misuse them? So we have now the Firearms Act in Canada, which does this but it's so overwhelming because it makes the simple ownership of a firearm a criminal offense that is totally odious and has to be done away with and that will be the political issue that you the activist will be working on probably for the next number of years because this is has to stop and the courts aren't going to do it the bureaucrats aren't going to do it the police aren't going to do it it's you working with members of parliament that are going to make this happen there's no other way to do it in our system and there's you that have to do it don't expect jim to do it don't expect ed to do it don't expect all these other guys you hear about do it because most of them are dead and the rest of us are older than, than moses and we're not going to be here forever that's why we're doing this so you guys understand where we came from. So C C eighty three. Um, the registry issue came up again, and this has been boiling around Ottawa all through the seventies. The Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police, ironically, because they're not our friends, normally speaking, uh, poo pooed it based on practicality. They didn't have any problem with the concept of registering guns, just the technology didn't exist. And this was based on the Canadian handgun registry, uh, which had been done manually since 1936 and was just an absolute gong show. It was useless. Uh, this, the information was uh, misfiled, lost, confused, inaccurate, uh, just living example of how firearms registrations don't work as a matter of fact, although the bureaucrats and the police departments are very proud of the handgun registry in Canada. It's been absolutely useless. Criminals still have handguns and still commit crimes and civilian shooters still have loads and loads and loads of regulation and bureaucratic, or bureaucratic harassment on them uh, and they're not committing any crimes but of course that's probably the deal. During this time, this is interesting, the government also uh, got rid of capital punishment and there are commentators of the day, and I would put myself in one of them, who saw the capital punishment thing as kind of a trade-off. We'll get, we'll, we'll get rid of capital punishment to people who are kind of law and ordinance, but we'll crack down on guns. So it's kind of a trade-off. Now this is our first compromise that I want to talk about. So we won't, we won't kill murderers. I wouldn't kill murderers at that point for a decade and a half anyway. Um, but we will uh, 
we will banish it, abolish it for good, and in turn for which we'll have stricter gun controls. And this was a compromise that was offered to the parliamentarians uh, to uh, to put this through. The capital punishment vote, to my knowledge, was a free vote. In other words, it wasn't forced or whipped by the political parties. But even though against public opinion, which ran and still consistently all these years later, runs strongly against the abolition of capital punishment, it did pass. As I know enough, the gun control bill, C-83, crashed in flames. We, the people, reared up on our hind legs and we launched a letter writing campaign that went on for years, as a matter of fact, and we deluged Ottawa with letters. We were getting bags of letters every day being sent. People were sending letters to every member of parliament, to every senator that they could get their hands on. They're sending multiple letters. And of course in Canada, those letters are what they call frank. They're not, um, they don't have to have postage on them. So we probably broke the back of the post office right there. I don't think they ever made money after that, trying to get over that. It's just, I'm being smart. It's probably not true. But it makes you want to stop and wonder. It was the greatest letter writing campaign in the history of Canada. And the conservative party, the progressive conservative party stood up against it. And Jack Horner, the renegade progressive conservative, Diefenbaker uh, cowboy, they called him, uh, who had crossed the floor to uh, sit as a liberal. He claimed that he, he'd killed it because he was in cabinet at the time. Uh, of course, that's what happened. The politicians take credit for it. And the people who probably actually did stop it get no credit at all. So C83 comes to a crashing halt. And I'm going to take this episode to crashing halt and bring you on to the next one in the next episode. Thanks. Thanks for dropping in and watching. Uh, if you liked what you saw, please share it with your friends. Please like it. Please subscribe to our channel. You can drop into www.the1000.ca and follow our, our movement. Bye.